Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church this August 30th. And I want to, uh, again, as always, invite you, if you are watching this service uh, either before or at 10.30 on Sunday morning, you are invited to join us for fellowship on Zoom afterwards around 11.30. Um, and if you need information on how to do that, please let me or the office know. And also, I, I just caught myself saying something. I uh, misspeaking when I said if you were watching worship. I uh, invite you to uh, remember that the service is not something we watch. Even though it's on our screen and we're used to watching stuff on the screen, it actually isn't a performance as beautiful as the prelude was. Linda was not performing for us. Rather, the pastor and the musicians are all participating with you in worship. And therefore, uh, we are all encouraged to participate in the worship. And I've been thinking about this, and, and I'll, I'll actually be talking a little bit about it with the kids, uh, about how to make our online worship uh, more worshipful and little less like we're watching TV. And so one of the ways we can do that is I invite you, um, whether, uh, whether you've already done it, perhaps you have, or in the future, uh, to set up a worship space for yourself perhaps light a candle, have uh, uh, other uh, important uh, items like your Bible or a hymnal or maybe a cross. Just make a little space for yourself for worship to, to make this time, this 10.30 on Sunday morning or whenever, whenever you are worshiping, to set it aside to be a little different than all the other time we spend uh, in front of a screen, which these days for most of us is a lot of time. And then light your candle, and take a few breaths, press play, uh, listen to the prelude, and, take, and use the prelude time as an opportunity to center yourself and uh, get ready to worship God together. Though we are not together physically, God's Spirit is with each one of us as we worship together apart. And therefore, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Please join me in the call to worship. The God of our ancestors calls us to worship. Praise the Lord. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let us worship God. Please stand, uh, if, you, if you feel comfortable doing so, please stand and join in singing Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Please join me 
in the prayer of confession. God of mercy, we confess that, like the disciples, we set our minds not on divine things, but on human things. Doubting your loving and care, we grab for more than we need. Doubting your loving purposes, we shrink from living as your followers. Doubting your loving plan, we become stumbling blocks in your creation. Forgive us that we may gain new life in you. For it is in Jesus' forgiving name we pray. Amen.
Our gospel lesson this morning comes again from Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. Listen for God's word for you this day. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, and you are setting your mind on not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. actually, after we sing a song. And you might want to listen, because it's a good story. There's a lot of really good stories in the Bible, and this one's about Moses, and it's a good one. And then also, it's going to be one of those times when I, um, when I talk like I am a person in the Bible, and I talk as if I'm Moses, so that might be interesting for you. But regardless, before we get there, the story that we're going to hear today in worship starts off with Moses is out with his sheep, and he sees something strange. He sees a bush that is burning, but it's not burning up. So it just keeps burning without burning up. Now, you've probably seen stuff burn up before, but not quite like this. And Moses thinks, hmm, what's that? I need to check that out. And he hears a voice coming from, from the bush, and it happens to be the voice of God. If you just see a bush burning that's not burning up, it's, it's probably going to be uh, something special. And this time it's God. And God tells him, the first thing God tells Moses is to take off his shoes because, take off his sandals because the land he is on is sacred. Now I'm wearing sandals, but I'm not going to bother taking it off because the, they take too long to take on and off. But that was just God's way of saying this is, this is a special time. So I've been thinking about that for our worship, and, and I talked a little bit about this at the beginning of worship, about, about ways that, even though we're not in the sanctuary together, even though we're not in the church together, ways that we can, uh, in our own homes, or wherever, wherever we're doing our worship, ways that we can make our worship together a little different than our other times when we're on, when we're watching TV or when we're doing something on the computer. So one of those ways that I've suggested is that we, um, that, that we all have a little candle or a big candle uh, that we set, that we set and we light just like we light the, the Christ candle at the beginning of worship. I'm not sure if I can do this. It's a two-handed job. Or maybe more. There we go. So you're uh, a grown-up can light the candle for you, or maybe you have those cool candles that that are electric instead of instead of uh, lighting with a match or a lighter. You can light the candle, and then you take a couple breaths, a couple deep breaths, just to get yourself ready for worship. 
And maybe you'll put something else by your candle. Maybe you have a Bible or a hymnal or, um, or, some, or a cross or maybe a shell or a rock that's special to you. And this is a way that we, um, that I was thinking that maybe we can make our worship time uh, feel, feel more, a little more sacred than our normal time. Because so, we already set this part, time apart. And so I hope you'll help um, the adults in your life, mommy, daddy, grandma, grandpa, help them uh, make, set this space for our worship together. And now, I don't know if you remember, last week I talked about a song, They'll Know We Are Christians, and that's what we're going to sing now, after your blessing. You are a beloved child of God. With you, God is well pleased. Thanks for coming out. He said, further, 
I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the land, to the country of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites, the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And he said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign of you for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent you. God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my title for all generations. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, who spoke to Moses from the burning bush, Speak to us now in the reading and proclaiming of your word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I guess I was getting practice leading my father-in-law, Jethro, sheep around the wilderness, I was getting practice for what was going to be happening next. Well, for the rest of my life. Of course, the sheep were easier to lead, and they didn't complain as much, didn't blame me when things didn't go right. In fact, they didn't even seem to notice when things didn't go right. Yeah, the sheep were much easier to lead through the wilderness of Mount Horeb. And I guess that's when it all started. That was the first time that God talked to me. But he did it in a weird way. Or at least it seemed weird to me at the time. I was just out there with the flock when I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. And when I turned to see what it was, I saw this. A bush ablaze. And it was burning, but it wasn't burning up. It's hard to explain. I mean, it was on fire, but it wasn't burning up. It wasn't turning to charcoal and embers or anything. It just kept burning. And I guess that's the only way to explain it. <coughs> so I said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why this bush is not burned up. What? You don't talk to yourself? Sure I talk to myself. Out there alone in the wilderness, just me and the sheep? I talk to myself. Can you blame me? I also talk to the sheep sometimes, but they don't make very good conversationalists. Anyway, I guess that was the moment that God was waiting for. God certainly got my attention. As I started walking toward the bush, that's when I heard my name coming out of the bush. Moses! Moses! Yeah, I told you it was weird. God got my attention all right. And without even thinking, I said, here I am. 
It's a response typically used by a servant or a child or other subordinate of some sort. It's how they answer when they are called by their superior. I don't know when the last time was I said, here I am, to someone. Being raised as Pharaoh in Pharaoh's household, pretty much the only person I would ever reply with uh, to use here I am with was Pharaoh himself. On the other hand, I heard many of people use it in response to my call. I must have just somehow, I don't know, somehow known by instinct that this voice was coming from the one who was far greater than I. And I was right. But as I approached the bush, the voice said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Take off my sandals and stand barefoot on the hot sand? I didn't understand at the time why the land being holy meant that I had to take my sandals off. Since then, I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about it. And maybe it's because the sandals were protecting me. Sandals make it easier to walk so we don't burn our feet or get rocks or stickers and other painful stuff in our feet. And to an extent, they also keep our feet clean. But when we come to talk to God, we are on God's holy ground. We need to remove our protective wear and open ourselves up, make ourselves vulnerable to what God has to say to us. Of course, sometimes it might be something we'd rather be protected from, but that's just the way God works. So I did. I took off my sandals, and the voice continued, I am the God of your Father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And that's when I hid my face. Hearing the voice say that it was God was frightening. I was afraid to look at God. I might not have had my sandals on anymore, but I still needed protection from God. God's self is so much more for humans to take. It's too much for humans to take. Yes, our God, God, our Father, is a loving parent and all of that, but God is also truly awesome. Much too awesome. Much too everything for us to comprehend. Later on, much, much later on, I came to a point where I could actually see bits and pieces of God. Or God, I could see a bit of God through a veil. But at this point, even that was too much for me. I had to hide my face from God. And the voice continued, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their suffering. After all of these years of enslavement in Egypt, many had forgotten about God, or if they remembered God, they were sure that God had forgotten them. Some were angry with God, some doubted the promises that God had made to our ancestor Abraham. After all, if we were God's people, how could God let this happen to us? What did we do to deserve this treatment? These were the kinds of things I would overhear the Hebrews talk about when they didn't know I was listening. I, too, had the same doubts. I was grateful that by some stroke of luck, I, a Hebrew, was adopted into Pharaoh's family and raised as an Egyptian prince instead of a Hebrew slave. But after the incident, the incident when I killed an Egyptian who was beating a Hebrew, after fleeing for my life, I did consider. I did consider, when I thought of it at all, that there was something wrong with the God of the Hebrews. Either that God did not exist, or that God did not care. Or maybe that God was just plain mean. Whatever the case, I didn't see any reason for the Hebrews to be worshiping God. 
But when God started talking about how he saw the misery of his people, he actually called them his people, and that he knew their suffering, I had to listen. Was it possible this God did, did care about the Hebrews after all? Is it possible he cared when no one else did? And then God said it. God said the most amazing thing. As if God were speaking from the bush was not amazing enough, God said, I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians. Enough is enough, God said. No more Hebrew slavery. And what's more, God said he would bring them out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. To be honest, I wasn't sure how great that would be. A land flowing with milk and honey sounds sticky and maybe even stinky if that milk starts to sour. But I guess it was supposed to be a good thing. The Hebrews would be much better off in the land of wheat and barley, I thought. Maybe some olives and grapes and wine, if you ask me. But of course, God didn't ask me. And when I started to wonder, why was God talking to me about all of this anyway? Sure, I'm Hebrew by birth, but I was never raised that way. And I wasn't living with the Hebrews even now. What did any of this have to do with me? And as if God knew just what I was thinking, because God is God, and he, God probably did know just exactly what I was thinking, God said, the cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. I did not see that coming. God wants me to go to Pharaoh to get the Hebrews out of Egypt? Me? I'm a fugitive from Egyptian law myself. I'm going to, what, just walk up to Pharaoh and say, hey, well, I had no idea what I would say. But I was going to somehow convince Pharaoh to just let the entire workforce be on their way. Sure, that's going to happen. And then we'll just move into the land flowing with milk and honey, and everything's going to be butterflies and rainbows. Count me out, is what I wanted to say. But of course, you can't just say thanks but no thanks to God. So instead, I tried to talk him out of it by convincing him that I was not the man for the job. So I said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? I thought it was a pretty good point. It wasn't just false humility in an attempt to get out of the impossible thing that God wanted me to do. Okay, it might have had a touch of false humility to it, but I really couldn't see myself succeeding. I couldn't see anyone succeeding, and I didn't want to be the one caught up in the colossal failure that would be happening. If I was going to do this, I was going to need some convincing of my own, preferably beginning with how great I am and why he chose me for the job. But an ego boost was not what I got. Instead, all he said was, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. Uh, I'm sorry, but you're, are you even trying to convince me to do this job? You're going to give me a sign after the fact? After the sign, after the, I've done it, and then the sign is going to be that we're going to worship you? I don't think so, is what I wanted to say, but again, you don't just say something like that to God. So I gave it another try, using a different tactic. God didn't seem to understand that I wouldn't be able to get Pharaoh to let all of the Hebrews just walk away. So I tried the Israelite angle. 
I said, well, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is your name? What shall I say to them? I mean, really. What would they say when an Egyptian-raised Hebrew fugitive they've never even liked, envied mostly, what would they say when this man they hate comes and tells them that their God sent him? Well, at the very least, they're going to want to hear his name. I thought I had it here because God had never revealed his name to anyone, as far as I knew. So the best case scenario, he decides I'm more trouble than I'm worth. But the worst case scenario, he doesn't change his mind, but at least I might learn his name. I think God might have been getting a little tired of my arguments, because he responded, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent you. Thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of the ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. Well, I guess I should have known better than to try to have a battle of wits with God. That is, with I am who I am. But now that I think about it, that's kind of funny, because I asked him, who am I? And now he's telling me, I am who I am, which really doesn't answer the question. He might as well have told me, none of your business, just do as I tell you. And of course, I did. So that's how it all started, thinking back on that burning bush. I don't think it was only the bush that was blazing. What I mean is, it was like, it was as if there was some of that fire from the bush, maybe just a little spark or a flame, somehow went from the bush into me, into my heart, into my mind, into my being, into my soul. And it was that bit of flame which gave me the power and the courage to do everything I had to do from that point on. It was as if God's spirit were burning within me. Not that I am God, of course, but just a bit of God lived inside of me. And I think that's true for all of us. I think that we, all of us, each of us has the flame blazing inside of us, and we're called to pay attention to it. We're called to tend it so that we too, each of us, may go where God calls us. Amen. Friends, we come to the time in our worship together when in the old days, when we met together, we'd be taking up the offering, we'd be passing a plate down the aisle, down the pew. And though we don't gather together anymore, we still have needs of the church, needs of mission, and we all are still called, just like Moses, called to serve. So during the offertory, I invite you, uh, all of us, to uh, spend the time just meditating on our commitments to God, and our commitments to this church family. Remembering the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans in which he encourages us, do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, and serve the Lord.
We give thanks to you, O Lord, for your sustaining presence and abundant grace. Receive now these gifts we bring to you out of our generous, out of your generous provision in our lives. May they be used to satisfy the hungry in famine, relieve the oppressed in time of trouble, and to proclaim everywhere the good news of your Son, in whose name we pray. Friends, we come to the time to share our prayers of joy and concern with one another. As uh, we typically have been doing, I will simply say the prayer request. I will conclude with God in your mercy or God in your grace. And we will, uh, I invite you to help me lift it to God by saying, hear our prayer. Of course, you're welcome throughout the week to send prayer requests for me to include in, in our worship time. But also additional prayer requests can always be shared during the Zoom fellowship following worship. We lift prayers uh, this, this day, beginning with those who are experiencing natural disaster and the impact of climate change, particularly mindful of those suffering from fires in California. And uh, as, as we record this service on Wednesday evening, uh, we are concerned about uh, Laura, Hurricane Laura that is approaching Texas and Louisiana. By Sunday, we'll know uh, what has happened, and unfortunately, we will probably have people to pray for uh, still at that time. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And of course, we pray as well for those suffering natural disaster here in Iowa and in the Midwest, those still suffering from the impact of the derecho, and particularly mindful of uh, the farmers who have been uh, hit so hard. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for those suffering from illness, whether physical or mental. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we pray for those suffering uh, the, the, from the coronavirus in whatever way that may be, whether they, uh, those who have it, those who are fighting it, those who have lost loved ones, those who have lost jobs, uh, all those who are impacted. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And this week, uh, the week of uh, August 30th, we pray for uh, Union Park Presbyterian Church of Des Moines and their pastor, Reverend Don Ely. And we pray for First Presbyterian Church of Bethany Center and Jolene James. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And as we do each week, we pray for peace throughout the world, particularly in South Sudan. We pray for our divided country and we pray for our broken world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Continuing in prayer, let us pray. Listening, God, you heard the prayers of the Israelites. Hear now these prayers. For peace where there is conflict. For food where there is hunger. For hope where there is despair for health where there is sickness, for faith where there is fear, for life where there is death. We pray in the name of Jesus who conquers all that would defeat us, who gives us new life and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please rise if and as you feel led to do so to join in our closing hymn, number 438, Blessed Be the Tithe of Vines. <laughs>
friends, stay home in peace, remembering that you have that spark, that spark from the burning bush is within you, calling you to serve God, to serve neighbor, to love God, to love neighbor. Friends, stay home in peace, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always.